the Living Farms podcast, the place where we discuss biodynamic practices worldwide for you, your farm and the planet. So welcome to the Living Farms podcast. I am extremely happy to welcome today two very amazing women from Sikkim in Egypt. Um, these are Angela Hoffmann and Constanze Abulej. And um, yeah, welcome for being, welcome. <laughs> Thanks for being Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. So um, at the beginning of the podcast, I always dive into the topic by asking, how did you come to biodynamics and um, what are you currently working in this field? So maybe um, we start with you, Angela, like what, how did you come to biodynamics? I think I brought it with me when I came to Earth. So from a little child on, I always wanted to work in the garden and with animals especially. And in all holidays, we had to go to a place where there are cows. And it was very clear for me always that I will um, be a farmer. And as I was in the world of school, my father was a world of teacher. So I grew up in an anthroposophic environment. It was also clear for me that I will work in biodynamic agriculture, which I then started directly after the school. Wow, that's, that's great. And you, what are you currently involved in at Sekim? Like what, what are your tasks there? Or what do you My do? main task is now... Um, caring for the biodynamic preparations. We make them central in Sikkim for all Egyptian biodynamic farmers. We grow the plants and we make the preparations. And in training for the farmers also, for the students from the university, from the schools. So training and the biodynamic preparations and also doing research in the biodynamic area. So what about you, Constanze? How did you came to biodynamics and anthroposophy? I, exactly, I came actually to Sikkim and part of it was biodynamics, part of it was the plan for the school, part of it was, it was my family. So I'm not specifically biodynamic or agriculture. I don't have this background. I'm a kindergarten teacher. But I have been part of it, of course, and I have been living with biodynamics for 40 years and plus now. <laughs> yeah, you, you both um, were living before not in Egypt, and then you then you both moved to Egypt to to be there with Sikkim, which I think is a, is a big step. And Sikkim has developed drastically since the last years, and you have been a big part of this change. So maybe for the listeners, can you um, can one of you explain what Sekem exactly is and what you're doing there in the desert? What kind of wonders you're um, you're doing there? Yeah, kind of wonders. <laughs> <laughs> Shall I start? Yeah, please. Well, the the story starts with Ibrahim Abudesh. Uh, he's Egyptian. And he was born in Egypt. He went to Austria when he was 19. He studied there. He worked there. He founded his family there. I'm lucky because I married his son. And uh, and uh, he didn't, I think he didn't really see his home country for several years. And then he came back in 1975. And uh, he saw many things which were new to him and many things which he was not happy about and he is a person or was a person of action so he made a plan what has to be done or what could be done in order to support the right things and to support a good development for this country and then he came back in 1977 and uh, he started by buying this plot of land which we are on now and another one near Cairo And he had a big vision. He even wrote, a, he, he wrote a letter to his father 
which he totally forgot because his father gave it to him many, many years later. And he was at that time already dreaming about schools and a hospital he would do for the people and he would do agriculture in the desert and he would, you know, work in sustainable, he didn't call it sustainable at that time, but in healthy uh, architecture and all that. So he had this vision from early on, I believe. And then uh, the second thing for him, as far as I understand, because I stepped in in 1978 or nine, uh, the first thing for him was to long for people. He had the deep wish that people would come to support him and to help him. And, and then it went from there, and here we are. <laughs> Many things developed. Mm -hmm. So at first, uh, he dug wells to get water in the desert, and then he planted trees to make the environment for a farm, and then started with the cultivation. And from the very beginning, he decided to do biodynamic agriculture. And then on the basic of this biodynamic agriculture, he uh, installed production with this uh, processing on the on the product uh, on this biodynamic product. So and always he told all people if you have good agricultural products, you have to make an added value on them. Don't sell them like they are because it's very cheap and you cannot earn money. So you have to have a processing unit to make uh, this added value and to get profit out of it so that you then can um, invest in the culture. So this was always his picture and what he, through all his life, uh, tried to tell people that this is the, the healthy um, life or the, the healthy um, way to do agriculture and to build up a community. And I mean, you really have a community. Like when Uli Hurta and I visited you in, in November, it was so amazing for me to see that it's like a big oasis of flowers and trees and people coming and, and going. And it's like a it's like a vivid beehive, so to say, because you have all of these different components, but they are really connected and flowing into one another. And for me, it was very impressive also to see that how you integrated the Egypt culture in that way. And um, maybe Constance, if if you don't mind, like it would be interesting how you how you managed at Sekem to integrate biodynamics and the regional culture in such a yeah vivid beehive system. <laughs> so how did that work? Uh, was this in November your first visit to Sekem? Yes, it was. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully not the yeah, we are we are in no I hope so too we are incredibly blessed really with so interesting uh, guests so really exquisite guests hand picked but there are many you know we are really really blessed we say this every now and and then we are traveling of course as well but uh, you know we have lectures and they come and they support us and it's it's amazing. But the other part is more for you, Angela. Um, how to to communicate the biodynamic agriculture to Egyptians and also the anthroposophy. And and also, I mean, I have the feeling that at Zekem it's it's vice versa. So both sides, it's integrating biodynamics but it's also integrating about egypt culture and traditions and that was for me very impressive to see how you managed those two together yeah this is even for us it's a daily wonder what we experience when we um in getting involved in any problem solving or in any task and we work with our Egyptian colleagues and we get to discuss 
how should we do this or that? And then always something new is coming out of it. Uh, not a German solution, not an Egyptian solution, but it's really something you created. And this is from a very early point we experienced that, isn't it? Yes, and Ibra, I just remembered, Ibrahim Avalesh has written in his book that for him it was the other way around. He was born in Egypt, so Egyptian blood, but then he uh, lived himself into the European culture. And when he came back, he had those two, and he was very much, he, lo he loved the European uh, culture, and he went actually to Europe because of Goethe. He was searching for Goethe's you know, and and then he said a miracle for him was that something new emerged, something third, not this and not this, but something third. And this is what we try every day. And this is very exciting and it's a learning path for all of us. And I just recall that you have certain structures and ways how you how you ensure that the people are communicating, that they get together, that they exchange also with the different generations. I mean, you're now in the fourth generation, I think, at, at Sikkim, or like the, you, the, the small children are the fourth generation growing up, so to say. Yes. And like, how do you how do you cultivate the social organism of Sikkim? <laughs> Do it. This is, yeah it's very complex you know it's it's not easy to to say this in two three four sentences because it has so many levels so one thing i see is when we came here you definitely had two worlds although there was something third emerging it was still two very different backgrounds and two very different worlds And there was no way you you could eat on one table. People didn't want this, even though we we invited them. It was for, they couldn't eat in front of you know these things, cultural things. But then our children went to school with their children, and there already a lot of things happened. And now when I see my grandson playing football with, you know the kids or grandkids of one of our colleagues from the older times, it is, it changed so radically. So, so it is so, it, something very, very new and very powerful emerged. And this barrier is not there anymore. So this is one thing we observe and we are very happy about. Because also, you know, we started, you can say that the, um, The start, the starting point came from the European side. But now we are, we, we, for example, when there was a festival, there was no festival basically without us, both of us and a few other people. And we did everything. And the last festival for me was eye opening because we did basically nothing and it worked perfectly fine. And this was a highlight. One of the key persons was a boy from the 13 villages. He went to our kindergarten, he went to school, he went to the university, and now he's in, you know. And he wouldn't definitely have a problem eating with me on one table at all. The opposite, he would be happy and I would be happy. Even he does. He does, yeah. He, right, he, he eats does. in the same cafeteria with us, so yeah. we are together. Yeah. Yeah. But this development takes time. So if we have have forced it in the beginning yeah. and putting all together and we have now to, we are one community and we have to make this together and, 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 it really would not have worked. So one has to give space and one has to give time and then things will develop. And also sometimes our teachers told us, yes, we understand we have to change and so on, but give us time. Yeah. Give us the time to do it, because it's it's really it it's uh, it changed the human being, and, and this yeah. goes for all of us, including sure. us. Sure, yeah. And yeah. I can I can only assume, and please totally correct me if I'm if I'm wrong, but 
farming can be a intermediate, so it can be a mediator um, for for time and for communication. And um, maybe Angela, like you, you were also farming a lot with the people, or like being on the fields. And um, I I just know that w when you came to Egypt, you didn't speak. <laughs> Egyptian, so you so I think, yeah. really needed to learn, and there with farming, it was also a way of communicating together on a common language. Or true, it's always if you work together, if you do things together, then it's the the bridge for coming together. And there, the first step, what I had to learn, I always tried to explain people why they should do this and this and this and this way. But they didn't want to know it. They told me, tell me what you want me to do and how you want me to do it, and I will do it. So this was the first step for me to learn. And it, uh, yeah, it was uh, really a great uh, path, it's a great journey, and it's until now. So it's, I think it's never ending. Until we will die, we will learn, yeah. and we will also fall in this um, thoughts what are uh, evolving every then and when, where we think in a German way and it's another thing. So it's it's really nice to to develop and to go on. And also so many things or uh, yeah so it changed so much because two three days ago I had the I'm I'm uh, I'm involved in the textile business. So I needed to know how many boxes, 40 by 40 by 60 centimeters, is in one cubic meter. And uh, Haney, mm -hmm. this guy, you know him? He, and, and he came to my desk and I explained to him, I, I really need to know how many boxes per square meter. And he said, okay, I, I, I can do that. I need five minutes. But may I ask why? I was so thrilled about this question. Why do you want this for me, you know? And it's a very normal question. Mm -hmm. And it's wonderful to see that people, you know, you can work with people then much more. It's more linked. It's more, yeah, melting into each other. So when you when you consider your beginnings on SECM and in biodynamics, so what were the the things that the people were interested in most on the farm level, but also on the social level. When we started? Yes. There were no people when we started. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> there were, you know, today when we have our weekend circle, we are thousand plus people. But when we started, and I still remember this because I always had Sarah, my eldest, with me. She, was, she just, you know, she was one year and a bit more. She was just walking. And she used to walk in our circle, and the circle was 15 people, maybe. And that was the big circle. So that was that were the people who lived and worked here. Mm. So things changed, <laughs> and nobody asked for anything. People just wanted to join and to work, and... They were very attached to to Ibrahim Abulaj. Mm. He was their father figure. He was a very kind, very uh, loving person, and they felt this. Mm -hmm. And they worked and loved to work and wanted to work for him, coming to work for him, and not question what he wanted from them to do. It's it's okay. And even if he shouted with them sometimes and was really uh, not good, and we tried to tell them, ah, it's malish. What is what is malish in in Never English? mind. Never mind. <laughs> so they told him, no problem. He's my father. He's my father. So it's everything fine. Yeah. And in this kind, you can really build up a farm, and you can really also work with the biodynamic preparations because um, what he is saying and what he is telling, that's fine. And this is right. And they felt it that they, he really um, did everything for their, their sake. Mm. So this was the, the direction we were going from the beginning. 
But today it's totally different, of course. Today people are looking for more and more. Um, they feel that this holistic approach is very, very essential to their basic needs, actually, you know. And from the very beginning, we have been working in the four dimensions. And I think this is a key to success everywhere for anything at any time in any place. Uh, because it, and it requires different people, by the way, because four dimensions is, you know, the culture and in the cultural sphere, different people would live than compared to those in the social sphere, societal sphere, those in the economic sphere, very different. And then in nature and environmental sphere. So it needs many, many people who work together, who come from these spheres. And it has to be clear that nowadays economy is the is the strongest everywhere wherever you look money makes the world go round and here it's different money is one thing economy economy is one thing surrounded by the other three and all the four of them have the same saying and more and more people seek for that you know they they like that or at least they see the community and appreciate that and want to live in the community. We have more and more people who want to stay on the farm. We don't have space. We just uh, finished six new apartments and they are taken. <laughs> <laughs> I could have a hundred. Understand yeah. immediately. I mean, but this is new. This is new because most of the people want to have, you know, in, in, in the reach, they want a cinema, they want more than one restaurant, the young people want meeting places, they want to go out, they want to have fun, they want music all the day, they want other things. But the wish for this kind of life also grows more and more, mm. which is very interesting to me. Yeah. How do you do that practically to work in the four dimensions? I mean, how do you integrate that in your decision making processes? Um, this is nothing theoretical. It's not an idea or it's not talking. It's just life. And you have the four dimensions everywhere. You don't have to create them. They are there everywhere. But normally they are, they are not balanced. And we are trying to balance them. For example, I, I still remember in Nature Text, I had, which is the textile production place, I had a customer asking me for a black baby body, a onesie for newborns up to maybe nine months, um, asking for a black onesie with a skull. Is it skull? Huh? Yeah. 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 Off, printed on it. Mm -hmm. okay. And this would have made good money, mm -hmm. you know. But then I went to the, to the school circle cultural sphere And I said, I have, I have a, you know, a mixed feeling about this. What do you think? They said no. And then it was no. Mm. Things like that. Mm -hmm. So it's a, and you also have to realize that to understand that dimensions are not separate from each other. They, they mingle into each other everywhere, always. So we just keep them apart in order to understand the different dynamics. Uh, but, in the end, they are one. It's life. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I made myself clear. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, you did. <laughs> okay. For me, at least. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is for me very, very essential. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I could not imagine being anywhere. I, I, I think this is the only way to create life. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's also giving space for the four dimensions to meet and to have uh, discussions together and to work on the same aims, on the same tasks together. And everyone from every dimension can give its input and in, in this way coming to the right decisions. Maybe we can also mention economy of love here. Mm -hmm. This is a certification we developed. And of course, you already have more than enough certifications around everywhere for everything. So we said we don't want to create something new. We are, it's based on biodynamic certification. 
and uh, it covers the other dimensions. And this is the only certification I know of which covers the four dimensions because you have uh, social aspects, fair trade, and so on. Of course, you have environmental and um, agricultural certifications. Uh, you have hardly any economy certifications. You have the pine wool. There is, yeah, and the share of the of the profits. Yeah, yeah there is, yeah, and uh, but you don't have them all together in, in other. In other certifications, yes, yeah, there's only always one very heavy, yes, yeah. And I mean, what you're doing with this is amazing. Like you, you, you are basically having the plan to spread all over Egypt. <laughs> like... No, <laughs> no, we don't. This is very important. This is one thing. You know that we have the 2057 goals. Mm -hmm. 2057 is far away, and which is very good because Ibrahim Obelish passed away for exactly 40 years after he started Sikkim, and he uh, had a 200 years plan. So he covered the first 40 years, and we said, okay, let's do the next 40 years, which is which is 2057. And uh, those goals, um, what I lost the thread. Why did I open the goals? What was the question? I'm very sorry. I no worries. I, I just said in a, a very um fun way that you want to spread all over Egypt. Oh yes. <laughs> oh yes, exactly. <laughs> and one decision was uh that we do not want to grow, but we want to offer solutions. And this is what we do. We we don't want to grow a huge but we don't want to to be like a multinational at all. This is not our aim at all. We want to stay the size we are, more or less, but we want to become big in offering solutions. Mm -hmm. And and this is what we concentrate on until 2057. And the solutions or the different projects, the different uh, second vision goals, we call them, we have 16, uh, go in five steps. And only the fifth step would be... Uh, Spreading all over Egypt. All over Egypt, yes. Yeah. And we managed so far with compost. Compost is all over Egypt. I see lots of compost piles which have nothing to do with Sikkim. The biggest joy. Yeah. And compost is now an Arab Arabic word. Yes. It's in the language. Yeah. It's adapted to the language. <laughs> compost. <laughs> so how do you how do you pronounce it then? Compost. <laughs> Compost. Okay, <laughs> so very good. And right, yes. yes. You, you showed me also, Angela, the the, the compost at Sekem. And was this then the the role model for the people, for example, to to see how it works and um, how this can be how this can be done? Or sure, we uh, anyhow we have the role model for everything for the schools for the ag agriculture, for the compost in the second farm, at the second farm. We have a small compost, which is for the students, and we have the big compost, which is worked with the machines. So that, and many people are coming and looking at, at it, how the waste is um, turned into a fertilizer. So yes, this is this are our models, which we show to people and we teach them how to do it and help them also. And we go there and look if they have any problems to to solve the problems and yeah to to teach and and to spread the ideas. And how is it in, in Egypt? You, you may need to help me now because I just know from other arid regions that it's sometimes really difficult to find the cow manure for making a good compost. But how is it in Egypt? Like, is it normal to have, have cows or um, how, how do you get the cow manure, <laughs> basically? Yes. In Egypt, it is still very normal. Mm -hmm. Even um, nearly each farmer has one cow at least, 
a donkey, some sheep. So the the cow manures in the in the farmers, the cows are there, so cow manure can be provided. Um, maybe the more difficult is the the carbon. That means the the tree cuttings or any straw, any waste of plants to make the compost. But um, of course, in the in the desert, when we go into the desert, there is no any material in the beginning to make a compost. <clears throat> and this was my my biggest uh, astonishment, may I say. Um, I want to make compost and there's nothing to make compost. <laughs> and then you have some straw, anything coming to, from, from the fields. You give it to the cows or you give it to the compost. So you need it everywhere. Mm. And now when I see our big, big um, heaps with the uh, cuttings from the trees and the straw coming from the fields, I really feel very rich that we make, can make a lot of compost now. Yeah, this is an issue in the desert. And how long will and you say the, the compost is irrigated? Mm. This is, yeah, yeah. It uh, needs watering. In uh, in Europe, we are used to uh, um, protect the compost heaps from the rain. We make a cover so that the rain is not going too much to the compost. And here we have to irrigate the, the compost heaps to have a good hum humidity so that the microorganisms can work. As everything in agriculture has to be irrigated. There is no rain. Uh, we have some years with 17 millimeters um, going up to 40 or 50 millimeters per year, <laughs> which is nothing. <laughs> so we are really depending on irrigating uh, our fields and everything from underground water. And there, biodynamic agriculture helps us, of course, a lot because the sand or the, the bare mineral is soil does not hold the, the water really very good. So by using compost and in, uh, in incorporating carbon into the soil, the water holding capacity is increased a lot. So we, we use maybe 50% less water than conventional farms. 50 or 15? 15. Wow. Yeah. Five zero. Yes. Well, and that's a that's a lot if you have seventeen millimeters of of rain per year. That's <laughs> like yeah. Yes. Wow. And also the microclimate climate changes with the time over the time. Even in yeah here it totally changed humidity and more rain and so it took years but many years but it changes. And yeah, and we have now clouds the whole year through. Yeah. And when I came 40 years ago, we had we saw the first very little cloud in November. Yeah. And we were so happy. Ah, see, there's a cloud. Mm. All the summer through, the sky was open. And, of course, humidity also escapes. So now humidity increased a lot. It was maybe 15 or 20 percent and now we have 40 50 60 percent of humidity in the air which helps a lot for the plants and for all agriculture mm -hmm. and like if you look at the the future of egypt i mean even if you don't want to spread all over egypt i got that point <laughs> but like if you if you consider the practices that sikkim is doing like what do you think, like, how much time would it take for other farmers to adopt those practices and really come into the benefits that Sikkim is showing now? Um, of course, this is going step by step. It's not something you can say three years is nothing and starting from the fourth year, there is a benefit. It starts at least from the second year. Of course, 
every farmer knows it that the first year is always the most difficult one. But then starting from the second year, fertility increases and water holding capacity increases. Uh, of course, we also plant trees and shrubs from the beginning. So uh, what the, the wind is broken, birds getting settling, other small animals come to, to the farm. So the biodiversity is, is increasing. Um, yeah, it starts at least from the second year and ongoing. And I think we can say from the fourth year, it's, it's really, one can say now it's really a biodynamic farm and, and working. You, you can even feel it, not only you know that it is. And there are many organic farms which are, which have nothing to do with picking. Not yeah. many, many, but some. And uh, maybe interesting in this context also is the fact that we are tackling 40,000 farmers. Uh, you know this, huh? that yes. we talked about it, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course. This was the COP topic, of course. And and this is very, very exciting. Mm -hmm. And the, we know that uh, the current uh, climate problems and everything and crisis has nothing to do directly and only with CO2. but this is a good um and how how do you uh, this is a good um uh, entering into or a good support a good uh a, a place to you know to support the farmer because the farmer um is has farmers in general everywhere have the problem that they need to make money and, and the produce is definitely nothing they they can live on. Mm -hmm. And uh, they also don't have the possibility and the know-how to do what we did at the very beginning, to have an added value chain. So the CO2 certificates are very, very essential in boosting the movement. And this is what we want in the end. We want you know people to start and to see to experience what Angela just said, and then you don't need to to apply any additional support or something. People will know, and and it will spread. I'm sure about that. Mm -hmm. And this would have been nothing to do with with Thickem Also, the forty thousand farmers we would uh, challenge, and we would support and we would uh, they would get consultancy and so on but they don't sell the, their produce to us or something yeah i mean that's, which is important that's that's true they i mean they're they're independent and but i still believe like that's that's one of the things which was also the idea of the living farms project to show farms that are so living and so let's say vivid and yes special in their experience that other people get inspired to yeah. to do something similar or to make it their own yeah. but, but to to exactly. come to this type of farming and i just love the idea to have um various biodynamic certified or non-certified um farms throughout egypt that are <laughs> like clusters of sikkim because I mean, you, you can't understand if you've not been there, but it's like, I really, for me, it was really impressive to see how many people are involved at SECAM and are really promoting this vibration, high vibration of the place. And I mean, you, you touched upon at the, um, in an earlier stage, Constance, that you have also this weekly cycle where, where you come together. Like, how do you think, also, not just the farm organism can be influenced and can be spread throughout Egypt, but but this idea of the social organism I found also very important because it's sometimes forgotten, <laughs> even in biodynamics, like we concentrate on the farm and there we're doing super good things, but also the social organism is very important. And I found Sekim to be one of the places where you balance the things quite well. So... How would you say 
could be such such a kind of such a so social organism be done elsewhere or was it really the figure of Ibrahim who was so essential that it cannot be done elsewhere I don't know it's, I hope it's not a too complicated question but... <laughs> yeah I um what I said before about the four dimensions and that the four dimensions need to be filled with different people different characters um, uh, which means you need to have a community. And the community is not living just by working together. It needs to be nourished. And this is what we do in our morning circle. Uh, we meet at 6.30 every day, except Fridays. Fridays is off. Friday is our Sunday. And we work on very different topics. Currently, we have a guest from Holland, and we hear about biography healing and, or, 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 yeah, I think Le something like that. Body landscape. Body landscaping, exactly. Very interesting. So we do many, many different topics. And some years ago, I started to bring my book every day in the morning and write down what did we do, who was there, and what was said, because it is pearls, you know, and I forgot. So that made me mad. I didn't even remember at the end of the year who was who was here this year? What did we read? What did we do? What did we do? Just, and, uh, so I, I do that. And this is uh, like one of the nourishments for the community. And we have different communities. We have the morning circle, which is only between 10 and 20 people. If everybody shows up, maybe 25, not more. Because not it's not for everybody, you know. Not everybody wants to share at six thirty. Things, and then we have other other things like twice a year we have the spring festival and the autumn festival for everybody. And uh, this is what we talked about at the very beginning, which was organized this time for the first time by some by a student from the school. Um, we have. The core program. The core program. Yeah. For all workers, they do artistical work. They work on sustainable uh, themes, getting to know what's about the sustainability and so on, so that they really can hook up with the with the ideas of SICAM. So it's not something our uh, which the business people are doing. No, it's our thing. It's our aim. And this is maybe even more individual potential unfolding. And in order to have a functioning community, you need individuals, strong individuals. The stronger the individuals are, the stronger the community is. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, this 6.30 meeting in the morning is very, very essential. It is a topic for newcomers the struggle i would say <laughs> and then people ask why do you meet so early and we don't want to meet so early but we were searching for one time everybody has you know is free really free not already planning and for the day and i don't know and this was the only time we found so this might change but uh, that's the reason why it is not it is with the years, I learned to see also other benefits. Like in the hot summer, it's just wonderful to walk on the farm at 6.30 in the morning. It's fresh and nice. But uh, other than that, it is nourishing the community. And you need nourishment for communities. And another part of the nourishment or where the, the art is implemented in the, the daily work is the beauty on the farm. Beauty and cleanliness, we are really looking for it and we have a, a group of 15 gardeners which are caring for that so that it's not just hanging a picture in the office but that all the surrounding is really clean, that there's a nice smell from the trees, that there are beautiful flowers, so all this has an impression and an impact on all the people. So this is the also this cultural side which is implemented in all in the daily work. 
Mm -hmm. In the daily life, it's better to say. Yeah, and that are things which can be replicated, I guess. Like you can you can implement a circle where people come together, exchange, and that you can implement beauty depending on where you are in the in the world. But this can be done on every every region throughout the world. That's that's great, yeah. Of course. It's just the thing that you have to understand that it is important. Yeah. Otherwise you will say, why should we come together and If every one of those workers now will work in this time where we meet, we can produce this and this and this and this more. Yeah. And from the very beginning of the farm, we had always these meetings in Thursday's afternoon. The last hour of the week, we are sitting together. There was a piano, there was a music, and... Uh, Dr. Ibrahim was speaking about anything, not about the work, about trees, about um, a religious uh, theme, something else which really nourishes the souls, which are so much in the daily work. And this always was a highlight of the week. Mm -hmm. Sometimes even fairy tales. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Yeah. 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 That's important now. Yeah? Well, that sounds that sounds good. Now I wish myself even more <laughs> to, to to join those circles. Um, you yeah, can come so, anytime. You're yeah. most welcome. <laughs> so at the at the end of a podcast, I always ask the guests why they continue to do their work in biodynamics, and I know you're a little bit at this generational shift now, where some tasks are being taken over by by others and so on, but. I'm pretty sure that both of you will will continue to be connected with um, with Sikkim in one or another way. So, what are your personal three reasons um, to to join or to be there still? So, do you want to start? Yes. <laughs> so. uh, <laughs> I know my answer because I've been thinking about it, but it's very short. <laughs> so. Um, as I see the, the biodynamic agriculture as really the basic and the most important uh, work on earth, I want to inspire as many uh, young people as possible in Egypt and all over the world. So uh, I will stay in this. Maybe this is one and the second and the third. <laughs> <laughs> <Good run. laughs> so yeah thank you very much and you Constanza <laughs> for me the first <laughs> the first reason is people and the second reason is people and the third reason is people hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the only thing really this yeah. is what I enjoy this is what makes me wake up happy and see and go out and just witness what's happening with the individuals and with the with the community and with, with the kids and it's a it's a miracle mm. a wonder as i said at the oh, beginning yes <laughs> yes <laughs> yes yeah. yes wow. thank you so much the two of you and um i'm pretty sure it will not be the last time that we've spoken and seen one another so um, thanks for joining the podcast and um, I will link Sekem but also the work you're doing with Biodynamics Egypt so that um, the people can check out what amazing work you're doing there and thanks for being here you're welcome thank you for having us it was lovely talking to you, seeing you and I'm very much looking forward to seeing you again <laughs> we will thanks <laughs> bye bye bye